Beyblade's European arc got weird fast. Unlike the first three arcs which were full on sports anime, this new storyline goes all in on fantasy and world building, bid beast lore, showing us Tyson's father, introducing Vampire Weekend, and an all new group of European champions. Taken together, these things work to expand the world of Beyblade well beyond BBA arenas. Welcome back to the Digino, thanks for your patience, we've got a lot to discuss so I won't waste your time. If you like these videos, consider subscribing if you haven't already so we can get to 50,000. Alright, time to let it rip. So long Vegas, we're on our way to Russia for the final world tournament and we're getting there via cruise ship passing through Europe. On board the ship, a purple haired punk massacres a bunch of kid bladers, Tyson being Tyson challenges Robert and in their battle we witness the sheer scale of the new kid's mega bit beast. Grifolian is larger than any bit beast Tyson and the others have seen yet and the monster bests Dragoon. We learn that Robert, despite being great, isn't even going to the Russian tournament. It seems not all of the world's best Beybladers bother with these tournaments. Tyson is dejected after this loss. Kai of all people is surprised comforting here, reminding him, your defeat could have happened to any of us. 31. London Calling The boat makes a pit stop in England where Robert gets off and the Blade Breakers consider following him but they fear they won't have enough time to make it back. A shady weirdo tells them the boat won't leave for another 6 hours and encourages them to explore the town. So they do, and when they return less than 6 hours later, the ship is long gone. They were tricked and are now stranded in England. Out on the street, Tyson has something like a migraine and suddenly a cloaked figure looking like a member of Organization 13 begins speaking to Tyson through his mind, at least in the dub, between Robert and this new Square Enix looking villain, Tyson has this very Goku moment of wanting to stay in Europe and challenge more powerful European bladers. He sees it like training for the Russian tournament finals. That night at their hotel, a mysterious package arrives with a VHS tape containing footage of Tyson's missing dad. It turns out he's an archaeologist and has been on an excavation for over half a year, and wouldn't you know it, his area of expertise is researching bit beasts or sacred spirits. I love Beyblade. Here it becomes clear that the show would use this arc's lack of a formal tournament to instead expand on and dive into the world, the lore of Beyblade, and I'm all for it. Tyson's dad reports that, quote, sacred spirits appear in fables and myths, always attached to small objects and appearing in a powerful burst of energy whenever called upon. Tyson says a small object like the bit in our Beyblades. That makes a lot of sense, says Ray. This is hilarious, but also it isn't coming out of nowhere. Remember, the White Tigers had been passing down Ray's bit beast for generations, and Dragoon was passed down as a family heirloom. Same with Drasil. The next morning, that organization member appears once again and steals Dragoon. We chase him into an alley where his mummy bit beast makes short work of Ray and Max's blades. Kai commands his Dronzer blade to do all kinds of Tony Hawk pro skater tricks around the alley, and with the mummy bit beast chasing him, the monster ties itself up in its own bandages. This sequence rules and is a stark reminder that Kai is meant to be a far greater blader than his teammates. We just haven't really seen him blade seriously since the first arc. Cenotaph and his blade, Sarcophalon, retreat into the shadows. Now it's no longer just Tyson who wants to stay in Europe. All four blade breakers want to stay to catch and defeat Cenotaph. The next stop on the Euro trip is Paris, and to get there we opt for a hyper fast underground bullet train. While the others watch scary movies on board the train, Ray goes to stretch his legs and is the first to discover the train is completely empty, save for a single silver dollar. We stop suddenly and the boys exit midway through the underground tunnel, and it's here that four of those organization members ambush us. They say, Hello boys, welcome to our favorite spot, the darkness. These dark bladers swipe the chief, and they say they'll only let chief go if they're defeated in battle. A goofy part I like here, they ask, do you accept our conditions, blade breakers? And the guys go, how do they know our team name? But like, it's not that big of a deal. They're a famous sports team at this point in the story, so it's not really surprising that another team of bladers would know their team name. For whatever reason, the dark bladers select Kai as their desired opponent, and with Kenny's life on the line, Kai just says no. They say, so foolish, your little friend is counting on you to save him. And Kai goes, yeah, sure, whatever, enjoy your home-cooked Kenny burgers. While the funniest moment in this arc by a mile. This is a wild relapse for Kai, especially considering how understanding he was about Tyson's defeat on the boat. Here, he's leaving Kenny to die for like no reason. The Dark Bladers' beasts are themed after horror movie monsters like the Wolfman, a vampire, and a zombie, and this is pretty fun. The boys will need to use the weaknesses that these characters typically hold in films. So naturally, Max and Tyson fire their blades with one shooting horizontally and the other going vertically, forming the sign of the cross. The power of Christ compels the vampire, and just when you thought it couldn't get any better, to beat the wolf man, Ray needs silver, so he places the silver coin he found on the train on top of his blade right where the bit beast goes, creating a one-time silver trigger variant. This is another moment that lives rent-free in my brain. For years, me and my friend thought we made this up, but nope, here it actually happened in episode 32. The authorities do show up, responding to the stalled train, and the monsters, or dark bladers, they vanish again. We get no real explanation, at least not in the English dub, as for why Kai utterly bailed on Chief. I guess they needed to have Kai relapse a bit so that they could reteach him the teamwork lessons in this arc, 
draft. While an unjustified relapse like this is not incredible writing, it will tie nicely into the second half of this arc, but I'm getting ahead of myself. 33, Last Tangle in Paris. The boys spend the day exploring Paris. The chief offers some genuinely welcome information about the cultural and architectural history of Paris. Whoever said cartoons won't teach you anything clearly never watched Beyblade episode 33. Up in the Eiffel Tower observation deck, Ray, Max, and Tyson once again meet with the four Dark Bladers. It's 4v3, and during the battle, the Monstars explain their evil origins. In the not too distant past, we ran into a little setback. A few years ago, we each did battle and lost, so we vowed to retrieve all the bit beasts in the world. Max says that doesn't make any sense, and I agree. But noteworthy, in each of the Dark Bladers' battle flashbacks, there are four kids battling them, whose designs are way too unique to be one off characters. In fact, one of them was Robert from the ship. Finally, Kai shows up, allowing for a true 4v4. This is the first time all four Blade Breakers are battling together, since Beyblade tournaments don't really work that way. It's a relatively inconsequential scene, but a standout moment in the anime due to how unique a scenario this is. It turns out a green haired kid from France was monitoring the battle. Not just any green haired kid, Oliver is one of the bladers seen in those dark blader flashbacks. Thank goodness for Oliver appearing here around the midpoint of the European storyline, injecting a well needed boost of momentum and curiosity into the arc. The goofy dark bladers were fun, but they just outed themselves as total goobers, and so if their return was all we had to look forward to for the next six episodes, I'd be concerned about this arc. But now we see one of the kids from the flashback here in the present. In 34, Oliver declares Tyson and Chief his new best friends, and over lunch, this champion blader tells us a little more about the other kids that each bested a dark blader. Something I quite like about this Europe arc is it feels like we walked into another series that is ongoing. Like the Europe Beyblade scene has its own storyline, history, and characters. It feels like a crossover between two Beyblade shows, like those Power Rangers episodes where last season's team reappeared and interacted with the current season of Rangers. Because this is Beyblade, Tyson and Oliver spar. It's art versus instinct. I found the 2D animated Bay battles really shine in this arc. 33 had a lot of great sequences, and here in 34, the battle was stunning. Ultimately, Tyson and Oliver have a draw. Not winning is a new experience for Oliver, but he takes it like a champ. He even name drops Enrique from Italy as someone the guys have to meet ASAP. After 34, I'm starting to get the strength of this arc. Up until this point, Beyblade Series 1 has been a pure tournament show. For the first time, it feels like I'm watching Pokemon, entering a new region with its own history, meeting new friends who later reveal themselves to be gym leaders or even members of the Elite Four. This Europe arc has taken us away from the tournament storylines long enough for us to miss them, presumably to make the final Russia tournament arc that much more captivating as opposed to feeling played out when we get there. But on to 35, when in Rome, Beyblade. Maybe it's Enrique's hair and fashion, but this episode gave me major Digimon Hurricane Touchdown vibes, the third part of the Digimon movie. We're hitchhiking through the countryside, only it's Italy, not the USA. We meet the very Willis looking Enrique, bleached blonde hair and a Californian accent, despite being Italian. Tyson convinces Enrique to battle, and he takes us to, well, Kenny describes it best, the scale model representation of the Colosseum. Tyson replies, kind of like an ancient Beyblade arena, which is just perfect. Enrique reappears across from Tyson in a suit of armor, and he shows off Amphilion, his two-headed Hydra-looking bit beast. Tyson is getting advice from Chief and the others throughout the battle, and for some reason this infuriates Enrique, who considers it cheating. In a series first, Amphilion goes to attack Tyson, not Dragoon or the Beyblade. Dragoon intervenes and protects Tyson. Lots to unpack here. It's the first real look at the bit beast caring for their human partner, besides Ray's white tiger returning after deeming Ray worthy again. It showcases the bond between Blader and the beast, and cements Beyblade as a true monster taming series. Tyson does ultimately lose, and it's a weird, dark bummer. Enrique says he never intended for Tyson to get hurt, and so he'd like to offer a rematch. Preparing for his Enrique rematch, Tyson tweaked the gear spin ratio of his Beyblade. Ray says, look at that side to side movement. The plan is for this controlled wobble to help Dragoon weave and dodge the two headed snake that is Amphilion. Back in the base stadium, Dragoon's new wobbling causes the Amphilion heads to smack into each other. Enrique is humiliated and starts scolding his bit beast. He's being really nasty, and all of a sudden, Amphilion turns on Enrique, attacking its own tamer. In an inversion of the last battle, Dragoon now rescues Enrique from his own monster. Not only does Dragoon protect Enrique, but Tyson's beast actually wins the battle. So this is our first victory against one of these European champs. After losing to Robert, tying with Oliver, and losing match one to Enrique, the Italian champ tells Tyson, don't go thinking you're special until you beat the guy I think is the best in Europe, Robert. And we're off to his castle in Germany for a rematch. Tyson won his Enrique rematch, so who's to say he can't win a Robert rematch? When we arrive, we're told Robert already has a visitor, and it's the Scottish Beyblade champion Johnny McGregor. Robert legit doesn't remember Tyson, and unlike Enrique who offered a rematch, Robert has no interest in battling Tyson a second time. There is someone who does want to battle though. Johnny has his eyes trained on Kai for some reason. Johnny's Beyblade, Salamaleon, is a Bakugan if I've ever seen one, and somehow they beat Kai and Dronzer, seriously 
humbling our favorite edgelord. It's the next day and the Bladebreakers are still at Robert's castle, refusing to leave until Tyson and Robert have their battle. Robert won't battle without stakes, and he says that he'll agree to play a series of best of three battles, but if the Europeans win two of those battles, they will take the Bladebreakers' place in the Russian tournament. Robert even flies in AJ Topper, Brad Best, and DJ Jazzman to shoutcast and MC this non-BBA showdown. Like a traditional BBA tournament, we'll have three challengers. In this case, Ray, Tyson, and Kai will spin on behalf of the Bladebreakers. Remember, the European champs aren't a real team despite having a storied past together, so Jazzman gives the Europeans a team name, the Majestics. They kind of hate the name. The Majestics throw on their armor, and it's almost time for the climax, but the Dark Blader Monstars reappear and swipe Kenny again, only this time they're kind of cheeky about it. They're just sitting in the stands and they go, He isn't really our hostage, just think of us as the Blade Breakers monster cheerleaders. This is kind of great. These monsters who were once a terrifying force to be reckoned with are now total goobers. They're like late series Rita Repulsa or the Pilaf gang in Dragon Ball Super. Match one is Ray versus Oliver and we're dying to see if Ray can redeem himself for his poor performance in Vegas. They both go straight to bit beasts and Ray is kind of crushing. As the Bladebreakers cheer on their buddy, Oliver is having something resembling a panic attack. Quote, there it is again, this feeling that I'm all alone and something is missing, but what? Before long, both bladers are knocked out and match one is a draw. The story is doing something cool here. The Majestics aren't a real team. Again, they're the Elite Four, but they're four separate elites, not a champion team. The second match is Kai versus Johnny. 39, a majestic battle, a majestic victory. Kai holds an early lead against the Scotsman. Remember when Enrique thought Tyson was a cheater for taking Kenny's advice mid-battle? Now it all makes sense. The Majestics all think this way, believing a battle is a true one-on-one. -on -one. Unfortunately, Kai sort of feels that way too. He doesn't want team advice, and in that regard, he's no better than the Majestics. Oliver tries to warn Johnny that Kai is up to something, but Johnny just says, quote, back off, you're bothering me while I'm blading. As a team, the Majestics are completely dysfunctional, and it's their downfall. Kai takes the second match, meaning the Blade Breakers lead by one point. Robert goes full, mustache-twirling villain, proclaiming, teamwork, how utterly childish, there's only room in the ring for two opposing warriors. The Monstars, I mean the Dark Bladers, become really sweet and wholesome all of a sudden, quote, I feel there is goodness in Tyson and his friends that must be protected. So I was wrong, they're not Rita or Pilaf, they're like Jesse and James in Pokemon. At last, the rematch Tyson has been waiting for since touching down on European soil. Robert versus Tyson. Robert's blade is initially pummeling Tyson's, and Robert says, where are your friends now? Grifolian goes in for the kill against Dragoon, but much like Ash in Pokemon the first movie, Tyson dives in front of Dragoon. I have to imagine this maneuver is an incredibly illegal move in the sport of Beyblading, but DJ Jasmine says nothing, so I guess we're allowing it. Empowered by Tyson's selfless sacrifice, Dragoon is now kicking Grifolian's butt. As the final clash commences, Robert says, you'll never beat me, Tyson. Your priorities are all messed up. To which Tyson says, if you think treating a bit beast with respect is messed up, and trusting your own friends is messed up, and having faith in your own team is messed up, then dude, you'll never win. In addition to summarizing the themes of this arc, as well as being a solid general life lesson for a kid audience, here I also thought Tyson sounded a lot like his grandfather in a charming, well-written way. The whole, dude, you'll never win, is a total grandpa line. Here I believe Tyson is that man's grandson. The blades clash, there's a huge explosion, and when the dust settles, we see that Robert's blade is down while Tyson's is still spinning. Tyson won his rematch and the Blade Breakers keep their spot in the Russian tournament. Kenny reminds us that we have a championship to prepare for when Mr. Dickinson appears and says, you've been preparing this whole time. As it turns out, he was the shady weirdo that tricked them into getting off the boat early back in episode 31. He orchestrated this entire journey. And there we have the European arc of Beyblade series 1. Another pleasant surprise on my rewatch, ultimately I think it was an excellent call to shake up the formula here and opt out of a traditional tournament setting in favor of this continental journey that felt very Pokemon, very Monster Rancher, and really expanded the world of Beyblade. With the Majestics and their storied past, us witnessing the bonds between Blader and Bitbeast evolve with Tyson and Dragoon, and learning about Tyson's archaeologist father who is researching sacred spirits, the world of Beyblade feels bigger than it did at the start of the European arc. By the way, we still don't know who sent the VHS tape with Tyson's father explaining sacred spirits to the boys, so maybe it was dad himself who sent it? I'm incredibly curious if this gets answered in the next and final arc, or if this just goes ignored. I guess you'll need to watch my next Beyblade Beyblade review to find out. Be sure to subscribe so you don't miss it. Emotional MVP of this arc? I'm gonna say Tyson, which was a nice surprise. Comedic MVP of this arc? It's a tie between Kai, who left Kenny to be kidnapped, or the Dark Bladers for being petty dorks. The second Done Dirty award goes to Max, I think. Not done terribly dirty, but I think this was an inevitable consequence of being the star of the last storyline. He had very little to do this time around. Thanks so much for watching and waiting for part 4. The wait between this video and the 5th won't be as long as the wait between parts 3 and 4. Okay, see you in the next video. Uh, let it rip.